Hello, everyone. Good, the mic's working. Uh, so I just need to quickly uh, reset this. I want to show you quickly something that I think is pretty cool. Uh, so I have my presentation and Chrome itself inside of a Docker container. So I actually run my presentation by running Docker Compose up. And I click a few things. And it comes up on my other screen, of course. And so I think that's pretty cool that uh, you know, Docker is pretty versatile and you can even uh, pass graphics through it. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. It's probably not a very great use case for Docker, but it is, it is kind of fun. Uh, so uh, during the keynote uh, yesterday morning, uh, a lot, the question was asked, uh, how many people is this your first summit? And it was probably about half the, half the group put their hands up. Uh, and that means that uh, many of you have probably very recently had a discussion that looks a little something like this. Um, and not only has Lundberg here uh, told you to go ahead and implement a private cloud, uh, he also recently read in a uh, in-flight magazine about this thing called Docker, and now he wants you to Dockerize everything, right? Uh, and so what, I, what I'm up here to do is I've been messing around with Docker and OpenStack uh, and together uh, for quite some time, and this is kind of a brain dump of uh, stuff I know, stuff I've done, um, some tools and stuff that I've found useful, and that kind of thing. I've tried to put it together in a somewhat useful agenda, uh, and we'll see how we go. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Docker is. Um, you probably all have a pretty good idea, so I won't go into too, too in-depth. Uh, I'm then going to talk about running Docker on OpenStack. Uh, I'm then going to talk about running OpenStack on Docker. Uh, and then we're going to go through some tools and ideas to help you run, uh, uh, operationalize Docker and run apps inside of Docker that maybe aren't the most Docker-friendly apps, which is what we all kind of have to do because we don't, we're not all dealing with uh, these great sort of friendly 12-factor apps. We all, have some, we all have a lot of legacy things, a lot of uh, in-house applications we have to try and run, and there's no reason we can't put them in Docker. And then I'm going to share with you some opinions I have on how to help your org get to a good place where it can effectively use uh, OpenStack and, and Docker. Um, but I should probably tell you who I am. So I'm Paul Tchaikovsky, uh, at Pchaikovsky on Twitter. Uh, I think of myself as a sysadmin still. Uh, a lot of people try and call me rude names like a DevOp or a cloud engineer. Uh, and I work at Bluebox on our uh, private cloud as a service product. I'm a, fairly uh, I'm a fairly early adopter of Docker. I ran it in production in 0 0.3, which was a year and a half ago or longer um, for a personal app. I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, I presented at the first DockerCon in San Francisco last year. I'm a contributor to Nova Docker and to Solem, both inside the OpenStack sort of umbrella. Uh, and also, uh, I've got a few projects sort of around the Docker ecosystem, uh, one called Dock and Stack and one called Factorish, uh, two examples, and I'll talk through those as we go through. And then also, I helped. Uh, build and run the container days concept, and we ran our first one in Austin. We've got another one coming up in Boston, and we actually have a mini one going on today uh, in the other hall across the, uh, across the road, which is pretty cool. Uh, so Docker at its heart is uh, process isolation, right? I've, I like the term. I didn't coin it, but I really love the term. It's Chirrut on steroids. Uh, it uses uh, the Linux kernel tooling uh, to C groups, namespaces, etc. to uh, to do that uh, process isolation. Uh, it, uh, it creates uh, shareable, immutable artifacts, which is the Docker images, uh, and then you share those via the Docker Hub or a private registry, etc. Uh, and that's actually the thing that has really pushed the Docker ad adoption, is the, the shareable artifacts, the, you know, the kind of the marketplace kind of thing, as well as the fact it's made it very easy to use LXC, whereas before Docker it was quite difficult. Uh, and also you can have as much or as little of an OS inside the uh, image as, as you want. This is the typical uh, VM versus Docker diagram. I ripped it straight from the docker.com website. I don't want to go through it in detail, um, but I just want to qu quickly touch on a few things. That is that Docker is containers. It's not virtualization. Um, but you can make it act like virtualization. You can make Docker app like a, act like a hypervisor, and you can make Docker, Im Docker images and containers act like VMs. Um, but it isn't, it isn't secure and isolated the way a, uh, a VM is. Um, it's sort of halfway between a Chirrut and a VM. So it's not Docker in containers in general and not a security feature. They're a, a way to do process isolation. And that's a pretty important uh, distinction. 
Uh, any OS capable of running Docker itself is capable of running your app if it's inside of a Docker container. So regardless if it's Red Hat or, or Debian or Ubuntu, uh, it, can, it can run it because it, it shares the kernel and then, bits, and then the rest of it is pretty much inside the container. Uh, it, has a, it has a layered file system, which is really cool because it means your containers can, uh, can share uh, sections of data, uh, which means you can have, uh, even if they're really large images, you can have very small deltas so they can still be downloaded and run very quickly. Uh, and you have really fast startup times, less than a second, you know, something like 50 milliseconds for really simple ones. Um, obviously, if you've got a, a weird app that takes 10 seconds to initialize, then you're going to have that plus 10 seconds. Uh, and then size-wise, anything from a couple of meg to a couple of gig I've seen, and that whole spectrum is fine. There's nothing wrong with having a really large or a really small container. Uh, in the Docker ecosystem, talk about a few of the things quickly, uh, level set, all the different tools and stuff out there. So from Docker themselves is boot to Docker. If you're running uh, OS X or you're running uh, Windows, you probably want to run boot to Docker to uh, run Docker. It's basically uh, VirtualBox and a really lightweight uh, Linux VM. And when you, when you uh, run it, it starts up a VM and sets your environment so your Docker client is talking to that. And you get a native-like experience with Docker on your Mac or on your Windows box. Uh, the Docker registry is, uh, is the artifact repo uh, for your Docker images, so you can push them uh, to it, you can pull them from it, uh, and you can back it by uh, object storage, which is really great because we have Swift. So we can uh, back it by Swift, and then the registry itself is, uh, has no real persistent data, so that's super, super useful for us. Uh, Docker Compose uh, is a way to start up Docker containers based on a YAML file, uh, so kind of like Heat is, but a lot less... Uh, a lot less features and stuff. Uh, really good for quickly standing up uh, development environments, multi-container multi development environments and stuff. Uh, and it's like it goes from, you know, we used to use Vagrant up, it would take five to ten minutes, now it's a second or two. So it's a very, very large uh, improvement there. Uh, Docker Machine is a way to spin up uh, machines capable of running Docker uh, externally, say on, the, uh, say on an OpenStack cloud. So you point uh, Docker, uh, Docker uh, machine at your OpenStack node, you give it your credentials and stuff, and it will spin up a VM, it will install Docker on it, and then it will create a, I think it does an SSH tunnel between the two, so you can talk to the, uh, the Docker API on the remote machine, but you're not exposing it to the entire world, so you've got less uh, security concerns there. Uh, again, super useful. Uh, Docker Swarm uh, is, is, is fairly newish, and it's doing uh, scheduling of Docker... Uh, containers across multiple machines that are running Docker. Uh, and then LibNetwork is brand new. They just acquired uh, SocketPlane and are having them rewrite the network stack and they're bringing in uh, SDN support via Open vSwitch sort of off in the future somewhere. Uh, out in the community, uh, we have a bunch of stuff. I'm not, I don't want to go through it all. There's tons. Uh, we have the lightweight OSs uh, that are designed to run containers, core OS, etc. We've got Kubernetes, which is a, uh, out of Google uh, for running uh, multi-machine process scheduling. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got Mesos, which is kind of the same thing, uh, but slightly different, and it supports Docker and a bunch of other different ways of running processes. Uh, we've got etcd and Fleet, uh, which I use quite a lot. Um, they basically, if you stand up multiple core OS nodes, they cluster together and you can tell Fleet to spin up a, 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 a Docker container and it will choose where to spin it up. And if that host happens to die, it will spin it up on one of the, ex one of the other hosts. Uh, so if you've got good stateless apps, it's, uh, it's a pretty cheap way to get some uh, pretty good HA and uh, scheduling and stuff like that. Uh, Drone is a CI tool uh, which is based on uh, using Docker images. Uh, so it's super fast to spin up and run tests against your code and then destroy it. Uh, again, super useful. It's kind of like a private CI, uh, sorry, private Travis CI. Uh, and then you've got the different PASs that are, that are based on top of Docker, uh, Deus, Flynn, Ranch, uh, the new one from Cloud Foundry, Lattice, uh, et cetera. So we're going to talk about uh, running Docker on OpenStack. Uh, and we're going to focus a little bit on the, on the OpenStack-centric tooling, right? Uh, so Nova Docker is the obvious one. Uh, it's got kind of an interesting history there. Um, you're probably all familiar with it. I'm not going to read it out. Um, and I know several companies that are actually re using it in production today. Uh, so, you know, it is definitely uh, production ready if you have the appropriate workload for it. Uh, and it treats Docker like a hypervisor and it treats your containers like a VM. So you get a bunch of benefits from Nova as far as scheduling, a uh, common interface, you know, so you're spinning up VMs the same way you're spinning up uh, containers. Um, but it comes at the, con at the cost of like some of the really cool things about Docker, like the runtime config, volume mounts, and stuff like that. Um, 
There are some folks working on improving those though. It does keep Docker's super fast start time, but remember now it's running in a distributed uh, system. Uh, you have to schedule it, which the Nova scheduler can take five to se 10 seconds to schedule. And then you actually have to download the image and run it, which if it's not already cached on that machine, could be several minutes to 10 minutes if it's a large image. So those things are still concerns. But once the image is there, it's got that sub-second startup. <clears throat> Uh, your image are stored, images are stored in Glance, so again, you've got that unified way to view uh, artifacts and images and stuff like that. Uh, and that means you don't have to run a Docker registry uh, if you want to use a Nova Docker driver. Uh, and it also uses Neutron, so we get a real IP address and we get security groups and some of those kind of nice things that we really like about uh, Neutron. And this is what it looks like to run it. You can see, really, it looks the same as doing a, a, a VM, right? The, the Nova boot command is exactly the same. Uh, it, the only difference is we do a Docker pull and then we do a Docker save and pipe that through to Glance Image Create. Uh, there's a heat driver for, uh, for uh, Docker. Um, again, there's some history there. I won't go through it. Um, and it treats as, it, uh, it adds a Docker resource type to heat so that uh, you can treat uh, containers as heat resources. I haven't used it a lot, aside from making sure that it actually works and does what it says it does. Um, a couple of things you want to be aware of is it does require you to do manual placement, so you're specifying which containers to run on which VMs inside the, the heat template. Um, and also, heat has to have access to the Docker API. Um, so that if it's, if it's a private cloud, that's probably okay. If it's a public cloud, that's a little bit scary. Um, this is what a heat template looks like uh, for, a, uh, for an existing host. Um, I, I, I pulled this straight from Scott Lowe's blog, so I attributed there. And he's got a, a bunch of really good uh, posts on it. So if, you, if this is what you're interested in, uh, go check out his, his blog. There's a long URL there, uh, but blog.scottlowe.org. Uh, the other thing which is actually interesting is when you combine Heat and Nova Docker is you get to use, uh, you get to use Docker containers via Nova via Heat. So you kind of get all the benefits of Heat and all the benefits of Nova and all the benefits of Docker. Well, some of the benefits of Docker. Uh, and so that's actually quite interesting to me. Uh, and it's actually how, uh, how Solem works. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Solem, it is somewhere between a, a PaaS and an applic application lifecycle manager. Uh, it is a, kind of an open stack native way to provide your users with a, uh, an application-centric uh, experience. It uses Docker as the application packaging mechanism and the artifact to ship around and also the execution runtime. And it uses Heat uh, to deploy that either via Nova Docker or to a core OS box and then to Docker. And that, that's if you want to do it on a multi-tenant environment. You don't, want to, you don't want to have tenants sharing necessarily sharing the same physical host with containers. So that gives you that isolation of VMs. As, uh, as Magnum uh, matures, I would imagine Solon will uh, move across to use Magnum for that instead of uh, uh, core OS directly. Uh, and the way it works is you tell someone about your application, you tell it uh, where on GitHub your application lives, and it creates a, uh, a Git hook up with GitHub. And then any time you do a commit to master, uh, it fires a message to uh, Solem. And based on a set of rules you have, it may run some unit tests. It may then create a build and put that build into, uh, into Glance or into a Docker registry, and then go and deploy that via heat, as well as deploying uh, any resources you ask for, like a database via Trove or a load balancer. Uh, and uh, again, I know of at least one place using it in production. Um, so if you have the right use case for it, it is a fairly narrow use case right now, but it is getting better. Um, it's totally doable to run in, you know, for running development and stuff. Maybe you don't want to run in production just yet. Uh, there's also Magnum, Magnum and Murano. I was going to talk more about them, but they were covered really well in the keynotes and also through other sessions, so I didn't want to you know, rehash things that uh, we all already heard. Uh, I do think Magnum is something that we want to watch really carefully over the next six to 12 months. I think that's really solving the problem in a really good way, um, maybe even uh, better than what Nova Docker is doing in a lot of ways. Uh, and then I also wanted to quickly talk about a, a PaaS I've used a fair bit called Deus. Um, I'm calling it out specifically because I've got good experience with it. I'm not going to say you should be running this. Uh, it runs really easily on OpenStack. I helped write the docs for it. Um, it also runs really well on bare metal and other cloud platforms. Uh, it runs on top of CoreOS and it uses Fleet and etcd and all of those things. And it is kind of a 12-factor microservices system in itself. Um, so they're, they're kind of eating their own dog food there where you're saying we're a PaaS, but we're also building it as microservices and 12-factor. 
Uh, and it gives you a couple of very familiar uh, user interfaces. It gives you a unit user interface that's very similar to Heroku, where you can do a, uh, you create your application and you do a, a, a git push, Deus, and uh, the, the repo you're pushing it to. And it pushes it to a git repo on Deus, which then kicks off a build and then runs your application. So very similar to Heroku. It also has a, a way to push Docker images directly to it, which you do a Deus push in your Docker image, and it will push it up to Deus instead of up to the Docker hub, and it will then run it and stuff. So you've got two very familiar ways of running uh, containers on top of it. Uh, but there's a ton of other passes that are coming out and that are building up around the Docker ecosystem. Um, it's just the one, the one I've used the most, and I feel it's the most mature of what's available right now. Uh, and of course, there's a bunch of other ways to do it, right? We can, we can, we can curl bash the thing, we can run Docker Machine, we can run Mesos, Kubernetes, etc. And they have limited time, so I kind of picked the ones that were more OpenStack-centric and the things that were kind of interesting to me, at least, and the things that I've used a fair bit. Uh, the one thing is, like, Docker and the Docker image is kind of the unifying thing amongst all of these. So even if you, if you use one for six months and something better comes along, it should be relatively straightforward to, to swap it out and use something else. So OpenStack on Docker, uh, about a year ago, year and a half maybe, it was before uh, Atlanta, uh, I created Dockenstack, which was basically an experiment to say, can I run DevStack inside of uh, Docker? And it turned out I could, and it wasn't all that difficult. Uh, and it also turned out be, to be quite interesting from a CI perspective. Uh, after you've built it once, you can build it again very quickly, which means for running tests and stuff, uh, it's, it's really useful. So Eric Windisch uh, at Docker actually took the project over and with the intention of using it for the, the uh, CI for Nova Docker itself. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how far along he is with that, whether he's done it or not, um, but it is kind of cool. Uh, first time you run it, it takes about as long as a regular DevStack install, but any subsequent installs are super fast because of the way Docker does its caching and stuff like that. Uh, and it does support uh, the Nova Docker driver and uh, libvirt LXC right now, uh, so it does like a crazy container in container thing. Uh, it is possible to use uh, KVM by passing in some sockets and privilege mode and stuff, but I haven't really messed with that. Uh, next we have Kohler. Uh, it's a collection of tooling for running OpenStack on Docker. Um, I've kind of looked through the repo. I haven't actually used it, so I can't give you too much uh, insight into it. I think it's a really interesting uh, concept. Uh, it is, uh, I'm not sure how practical it is to run all of OpenStack in Docker containers, you know, especially when you get to use stateful services like Rabbit and MySQL. Uh, but the APIs and the schedulers and stuff like that are, are perfect to run inside Docker containers uh, as long as you're able to configure them to tell it which database to talk to, which rabbit to talk to, stuff like that. Uh, if you want to run actually Nova Compute or you want to run the Neutron uh, networking stuff, you do have to do some uh, fiddling with uh, privileges and uh, using host networking for Neutron and some stuff like that to pass it through. But it is actually possible to run all of OpenStack in Docker containers, including uh, the actual uh, Nova talking to libvirt, to KVM, etc. Um, it uses the OS packages. I think it uses the CentOS packages. I would actually rather see it use uh, Git, um, because I think most people, most of us that are running OpenStack in any significant way have some patches we're doing or something we're changing in it, and we end up building our own packages from, from Git. So it would like, be good to be able to get that same workflow into uh, our Docker containers. Uh, there's a packaging tool called GIFRAP, which I use a fair bit. Um, it was written by one of my colleagues at Blue Box, and a bunch of people have contributed to it. Uh, it builds uh, Debian packages and RPM packages for the various OSs, but it can also build Docker images. So you, you, you run it, and it will grab your, uh, you've got a, a manifest file, which is a YAML file, and you describe which OpenStack projects you want, uh, and which uh, Git revisions and stuff you want to grab it from, and where the GitHub location is. So either the public repos and a, and a Git revision, or a private repo if you're running your own forks or patches or whatever. Uh, and it will, uh, it will go through, build them, and then spit out images. Uh, I wrote a tool called GIFRAP Wrapper, which is actually a Docker factory for that. And so it ac actually means you can run one command, and you'll actually get a Red Hat 6 image, sorry, CentOS 6 image, an Ubuntu 12.04 image, and a, sorry, package, and a Docker image. So you can kind of get, uh, it's basically a cross-compiler for uh, Linux uh, distributions. Uh, and you can actually, because you can have, uh, um, ah, it doesn't matter, I've forgotten. Uh, yeah, and I totally lost my chain of thought, sorry about that. 
Uh, so, so we have, so we, we've used gift wrap or we've done something else. We've used Cola to create our uh, OpenStack images. So we've got, we now have Nova uh, API ready to run in a container. We actually have to still configure it. We have to access nova.conf and we have to tell it where our rabbit is, what, what libvirt driver to use, all that sort of stuff. So there's a few ways we can write configs into a, uh, into a Docker container. Um, the first one is basically we just, we have a fairly static system, nothing changes much, so we just write the configs directly into the, uh, directly into the image. We just add, uh, when we do the uh, Docker file, we just add them, add them directly in, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you're already running Chef or Ansible or something like that to do your configuration management uh, for OpenStack, which I really hope you are, because it's not something you want to run without config management, then you can actually just keep, you, keep those configs and bind mount them into the Docker container and, and you're basically done. And then the, fi the final way, which I think is the really interesting way to do it, is to actually template uh, the config files and then use environment variables at, at the runtime to set those up. Or even better, to use service discovery. Uh, and uh, I use a tool called confd for that. Uh, it's super useful, that sort of stuff. But you can even use like an inline sed to change stuff at, at runtime uh, when you start up your container. Uh, now we're going to kind of flip to some operational kind of stuff. Um, so there's a bunch of like golden rules the Docker community has kind of adopted and will yell loudly at you about. And they're, they're not really rules, um, even though the community gets mad about it. Um, and you know, these people don't know what your use case is, they don't know what problems you're trying to solve. And so a lot of this stuff up here just doesn't apply to you. So don't feel like you have to do things like the, the Docker way. Do, do, it, do it make sense to you to actually uh, make something that's useful and, and good for you. Uh, this is kind of what they want you to have, right? They want you to have this unicorn app. It's probably written in Golang. It's fully 12 factor, and it's like a couple of megs of size. Uh, the rest of us, it's Python or, God forbid, PHP. It has a ton of system dependencies, config files. It's trying to write to log files. It may need multiple processes. If it's PHP, you probably need Apache plus PHP FPM. Uh, and your container ends up being like a gig or more. Uh, it's, it's amazing how small a Python app can give you a gig or more of OS and system dependencies even inside of uh, Docker. So and this is a kind of an example Docker file of, of that kind of application. This is actually a Docker file for uh, PHP. Uh, so it's doing Nginx, it's doing uh, HHVM, which is a PHP FPM-like thing that came out of Facebook. It's also got Runit for doing process management. It's doing etcd and confd uh, for, config ma for doing an, in, writing out our templated config files and using service discovery if we want. And then it's telling it what, what command to run. And then once that's in and we've done a build, uh, we can then use docker compose. And this is what a docker compose looks like. So we'll get, we'll get three, uh, three running containers here. One running nginx, one running hhvm, and one running mysql. And because of the Docker links, they'll all talk to each other. And we have a dev environment in less than a second with uh, like a, our, our tiered application. And that's super useful for uh, development work. Um, there's a tool set I wrote, I, talked about, I mentioned a little bit earlier, called Factorish. And it's uh, some stuff I wrote to try and figure out how to run more uh, legacy style apps uh, inside of a container. And sort of the, the brainwave that I had that made me do it was if we, if we put stuff inside of a container, and we want it to be 12-factor. What's inside the container doesn't have to be 12-factor. It's the container itself that has to be, right? So you can do all sorts of crazy stuff in the container as long as from the outside it follows those 12, the 12-factor 12, uh, 12 rules. Um, I have demo apps for it from anything from a really simple Python app to a full Elk stack and also a, a MySQL Galera cluster that will auto-discover itself using etcd and service discovery and, and set itself up across multiple nodes. Uh, kind of cool, and I'm not suggesting you should run persistent data in uh, Docker containers just yet. It was just a, uh, an exercise. Um, but in doing that, I learned a bunch of stuff. Um, Running multi processes, it's fine. There's no problem with it. Um, for stuff like PHP, it's kind of mandatory. Uh, and in, an init tool can also help you run stuff like Apache and stuff, which isn't all that easy and friendly to run, uh, like in the foreground in a Docker container, uh, the way that you should. Uh, and, uh, and my preference for init systems inside containers are Supervisor D or Runit. Uh, both are pretty good, both are pretty lightweight and easy to configure. Uh, when we're talking about logging inside of a container, uh, it's really key to never write a log file inside a container unless you, can, unless you absolutely have to. And that's because the moment you start writing log files into containers, if that container is going to stick around for a long time, now you need to do log management, right? You have the same problem we have on VMs and everything else. We have a lot less tooling to actually do that work. 
So what we can do is we, we always want to log to standard out and standard error, and then that will then push through to the Docker uh, log subsystem, and then you can consume those logs by other tools. This is an example of an Nginx config where we're actually telling it to log to standard out and standard error. So there's a dev standard error and dev standard out, uh, basically devices that talk to the Linux kernel and flip back. So when you're writing a, a log to a file, it actually writes it back to standard out of Nginx. So by doing that and setting daemon mode off and setting a user to run as, now when we run Nginx, it runs in the foreground and all of your logs, access logs and everything come to the, come to the standard out. And then now it's really, really good to run it in, uh, in a Docker container and you get all the benefits of running it in Docker. And you get the logs coming out to the Docker log, log subsystem, et cetera. Doing uh, configs in our, inside of our containers. I mentioned confd before. This to me is the, the best way right now to do this. Um, it's designed with service discovery in mind, uh, etcd, console, etc. But it also supports doing, uh, taking values from environment variables that you pass into Docker via the dash e. Um, it's a templating engine that's written in Go, so you kind of get all of the benefits of the, the Go language to, uh, to do things, loops, etc. You have a couple of files involved. This is kind of the metadata file for your template. You tell it where the template is coming from. You tell it where you want to write it to. You give it some other, other attributes, and you tell it which keys to listen to. And that will basically subscribe to those keys, and any time those keys change, it will rewrite your template file and then it can do checks and reloads and stuff like that based on what, whatever your app is. This is a template itself. You can see the double curly braces there. Um, that's actually getting the, getting the values that we've gotten environment variables. Now, environment variables can't have slashes in them, but etcd and console uses, use slashes and they look like a directory structure. So there's a little bit of disconnect there. So what, the, what uh, confd does is it actually capitalizes all the text and it replaces the slashes with underscores. So then we can consume it in a script like this. So this is the boot script that I, that I run whenever I start the container. And the first thing it does, it goes and collects those environment variables. And if they don't exist, it's setting, a, setting somewhat sane uh, uh, defaults, right? Which is what the squiggly bits on the right there is. And then it runs conf D in one time mode. And so that will write out the, the config files and exit either with a zero or a one, depending on if it, if it failed or passed. And then it runs Nginx. And it's using exec so that Nginx takes on the PID of the bash script that's running it. So it's the PID one of the container. Uh, and then also it does that wait at the end. And that's ba that basically tells bash to wait until all of its child processes have exited before it exits itself. And that just helps uh, reduce chances of getting zombie processes and stuff like that showing up. Once all of that is done, we just do a docker run command and it, all of our templating and all of that stuff is done. Uh, and that's pretty useful. If we then want to use etcd or console, we simply flip confd to, run, to not run in one time mode and it will run as a daemon, so you then want to run it via run it or supervisor d or something or just put an ampersand at the end and run it in the background. And now it's going to go and get those values anytime they change in etcd or uh, console or whatever you're using for service discovery. And so you've kind of got service discovery really cheap uh, and you're able to do it in an iterative way. So you start with environment variables, you get a little bit better, you move to, to service discovery. Um, flipping to outside of the containers. Um, so things are a little bit different uh, out in Docker land. Um, there is some tooling now to help smooth those differences out. Uh, stuff like config management, and by that I don't mean templating configs inside, I actually mean outside of the container managing uh, Docker containers themselves. Uh, logging, monitoring, and stuff like that. So very quickly, uh, config management, all of the major config management tools have a, a decent Docker story now. Um, and this is a really good way to bridge our traditional slash, like the way we do things right now and doing things in a more Docker, uh, Docker-centric way. So what we basically do is we use config management to install Docker, unless we already have it in, in, our, in our burnt images. And then uh, we use config management to, uh, to, do, to build, run, pull, uh, et cetera, our containers, our images and containers. And so basically what we're doing is, by doing that, we're treating Docker as kind of like a packaging format and a, uh, and a, and a, and a, a service uh, start and stop tool, um, which, is, which is useful in itself. And you haven't had to have adopted the entire Docker e ecosystem to suddenly start uh, doing useful things. Uh, there's an interesting tool called CTOP. It's fairly new, and it gives you a top-like top -like interface into your containers that are running on a host. Uh, so you can run it and you see, and it's not just Docker containers, it's also LXC and uh, also the systemd uh, containers, I can't remember what they're called now. 
Uh, from a monitoring perspective, like CTOP is cool, but uh, we actually want to monitor it and look at what, how much CPU is being used, how much memory is being used across the entire system and but for each container. Uh, now, Docker uses, used to use LXC, it now uses libcontainer to access name groups and C, C groups and namespaces. Um, and those things already put metrics into your system, but it puts them in crazy places, like that sys, fs, C group, blah, 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 blah. So it's kind of hard to find, and you've got to kind of be able to hunt them all down and know what belongs to what container and stuff like that based on IDs and stuff. And it's not particularly fun. So if you do feel like having that, like having that little adventure, you can use uh, Collecti or Sensu or something like that and build checks to go and look in those places. Um, there's probably some community checks out there by now, so maybe someone's already done that work for you. Uh, since Docker 1.5, it actually has a fairly basic uh, metrics uh, that it can expose via the API. So you can also go and interrogate those from uh, you know, Collect D or Sensu or something like that. Um, but what I use is I use uh, Container Advisor or CADvisor. Uh, it was written at Google uh, for Kubernetes, but it actually works really well for any, uh, any kind of Docker-based system. It has a web UI that looks a little something like this. Uh, it is only on individual hosts. Um, when you're looking at that web UI, so you're only looking at that one, that one host. Uh, and it does have a REST API that you can go and uh, grab metrics from. Uh, it can also send data up to uh, InfluxDB and Prometheus. They probably need to bring some support in for Graphite and some other stuff. Um, but pushing out to InfluxDB, we can then use Grafana in front of InfluxDB, and now we have, a, uh, we, we have all of our metrics going to a place. We can start building dashboards and stuff for all of the hosts we have. And so we just run CADvisor on every single host we run containers. And now, bam, we're getting all of our metrics for all of those containers, their CPU, memory, disk usage, all of that stuff. Uh, and this is how you run it. Uh, we have to bind mount in a bunch of volumes. Most of them are read-only, apart from var run, which big deal. Uh, we're publishing a port so that we can actually access it. If you're obviously running this out in the cloud or something, you might want to only expose it to local hosts and then do some sort of tunnel to access it so you're not exposing your metrics to the entire world. Um, and then onto logging, which is you know a similar need that we have, much like metric, much like uh, monitoring. Uh, and we, before we were working out how to log everything to stand it out. Now we're doing that. We use uh, Logspout by uh, Jeff Lindsay at Glider Labs, and it saves us a ton of work. What it does is it, it binds to the Docker socket and it watches the Docker log, log sub subsystem, and it ships those logs off via syslog to wherever you want. So in this example, and this is actually uh, from a chef cookbook. Uh, this is an example of using uh, the, the, chef cook, the, the Docker cookbook's uh, lightweight resources to run a container. And you can see, again, I'm bind mounting in the Docker socket, and I'm giving it that, that command, which is syslog blah, and which is, in this case, sending it to paper trail. Uh, and Logspout has, uh, has the uh, entry point hard-coded, so it already knows to run the Logspout binary itself. Uh, and then I actually uh, push most of my stuff out to an Elk stack. Uh, so now I just go to uh, Logstash slash Kibana slash whatever to view all my uh, logs, just like I do with all of my other infrastructure. So we're now kind of, we're equalizing and we're getting all of our logs uh, for Docker the exact same way we're getting all of our logs for the rest of our systems. And whatever, any, any tool you have that can listen on syslog can now ingest these logs, so Splunk or whatever else. Uh, and then you have container management. So with VMs, we kind of had the problem of VM sprawl. That's like magnified again with containers, right? Because we can fit so much more into a single host. Um, so instead of having uh, pets versus cattle, now we have cattle versus ants. And uh, so a management tool that can help us visualize all of this stuff and figure out like how many hosts are running Docker, what are they doing, how many containers are running, how many images we, we have, suddenly starts to become very useful. Uh, and this is an example of one. Uh, it's called Stack Engine. Uh, they're in beta right now. They're looking for customers, but I don't want to sell stuff for them, so I'll stop there. Uh, and then finally, I want to go into some recommendations on things that I think uh, we can do to help our organization uh, get better at uh, prepare ourselves to run Docker and to run OpenStack, depending on our maturity level. I don't know where all the organizations are at, so I'm kind of walking all the way through. Um, and of course, my first recommendation is uh, get some help. Obviously, I did this on a higher resolution than the screen supports. Um, what, you, you, what, what I mean by this is you want to concentrate your efforts on your own core competencies, the stuff that, like the, differ the business differentiators and the stuff that makes money for your business. Anything else, you can go and get help with. Don't try and do it all yourself. Otherwise, you're going you're gonna to lose focus on the things that actually bring money into your organization, the things that bring value into your organization. Uh, and I work at Blue Box, so of course I would tell you that you should, uh, you should use our private cloud as a service product. 
Um, don't, cha don't change things that aren't causing pain. That's kind of, that's kind of it should be a fairly obvious one. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got CI tooling that works really great, don't try and Dockerize it. Go and find something that isn't working so great and say, maybe Docker can help me with this. Uh, you've probably got a lot of legacy applications. Uh, I used to work at a very large uh, organization that had like 15 years of legacy applications and nobody knew what the hell any of them did or how they ran. Don't try and Dockerize any of that. Just like put a fence around it. Um, if you need to do something with it to save money or something, go and like pay someone to put it onto VMware or whatever so you don't have to worry about it and you can focus on moving forwards. Uh, and then as, you, as you're looking at things, you, know, you really want to think about what you, what you want to be doing in the next few years, but you want to see, say, what can I do now? What's the low-hanging fruit? What things can I start moving in that direction? Um, so you don't want to kind of build this big, long plan that's so huge that you can never quite execute on it. Find the little chunks you can, get, you can start working on right away. Um, so obviously you want to build or uh, get help to build OpenStack. Uh, I kind of have a, a, an opinion that we should start small and start with like the very, the, like the, the building block services. And then once we've got those figured out, then go, go chase the, the more interesting ones, uh, the, the, the weirder ones. There's so many now. Um, and you know, don't try and unify this with your legacy stuff. Keep that kind of separation so that you don't, you don't waste time trying to like do the same thing across both when they're not you know, the legacy stuff isn't cloudy applications, so don't try and put in OpenStack necessarily. Um, build up a good internal DevOps practice. Uh, if you don't have one already, um, ask for help. And by that, I don't mean go, don't go and buy DevOps, because you can't really buy DevOps, but people will try and sell it to you. Uh, and uh, get, so go out to find your local DevOps community, uh, get involved with them, uh, find the people in your org that are already doing DevOpsy kind of things and, and nurture them uh, and, and that kind of stuff. And also, obviously, you're going to be running OpenStack now, so start figuring out how to build cloudy apps, right? Stop trying to figure out how to do the cattle thing. Uh, how to build resilient MySQL, Postgres, Elasticsearch, all those things that are stateful, which you probably be a long time before you want to even think about doing anything container-based with them. I can't really stress how important DevOps is. Um, if, you're not doing, if you don't have a good DevOps practice, you shouldn't even really be talking about cloud and, uh, and Docker and stuff. You really need to get a good handle on... Uh, DevOps and doing stuff like config management, CI, CD, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and going forward, for a very long time, you're going to need config management because you need to manage your stateful applications. You need to manage your uh, legacy applications. You need to manage your persistent data, your MySQL, Postgres, etc. cetera. Um, so you want to avoid that, convers that conversation that's going right now that it's Docker versus config management. It's kind of both sides of those arguments are, are uh, straw men. And the, the, re the real thing is you need both to build a, to build a good solid platform. And speaking of platforms, kind of pick one and start playing with it right now. Um, don't think you have to instantly go to production. Play with a few of them. Get your developers playing with them as well as your operators and, and see, see, see what they like, see what they don't like. Um, if I had picked one right now, it would be Deus. And that's because it has a really good user experience, both from the developer's point of view, having that kind of private Heroku point of view, but also from the operations point of view, has a really good split of responsibilities where your operators run Deus, they run OpenStack, and uh, you know, they run your data persistence like MySQL or whatever. Your DBAs and stuff run your, run your MySQL, Postgres or whatever. And your devs just simply push applications into Deus. And it's very much like Heroku, uh, which is really, really cool. Uh, and that is kind of it. I wanted to end a little bit early for questions and stuff like that. Um, so any questions, raise your hand, and I'll see if I can answer them. No questions? Yes? So the presentation is Dockerized. Yes. Uh, it is here right now, and it is on a private GitHub right now. Uh, sometime next week, I will get it onto the Docker registry or something, or give instructions on how to build it yourself, and get it put up on wherever all the slides and stuff are being summarized for the, uh, for the event. Or follow me on Twitter, and you'll find it there. So re reconciling the config, having like a base standard so you don't have all these crazy different containers all over the place. So I, I kind of feel that, and this is really good where you get your ops people involved and you, you build out like a, a good base image. And it doesn't matter if it's a fat image because you only have it once on every system because of the layered, sy layered file system. So have like a Ubuntu 14.04 or Debian, Jesse or CentOS or whatever your preferred OS is 
put a bunch of system tools in that you think might be interesting, and then make that your base image, and then have all of your other uh, images uh, start from that. Uh, and that also helps get, you can help get your security people involved and stuff like that as well, so everyone feels a little bit better about being involved and, and, and getting them built. And also the images that you do build that you want to push to production, have them built by a CI system or something that's blessed. Don't just like build them on a laptop and ship them off somewhere. Because then no one has any insight into what's actually in there. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>